so I'm Stefan. Uh, I'm still doing my master thesis, but unfortunately not in Go. So I can't present anything about that. And instead, I will talk a little bit about writing Chase and REST APIs in Go. And I will basically split this, this talk in, in three parts. So first, we talk a little bit about JSON, then about some REST stuff, and finally about APIs in general. But maybe first, the motivation for this talk. Uh, so these days, when I'm like on, on Twitter or on Reddit, I feel like this, right? Everybody is talking about his newest fancy microservice and how great it is and everything. And I don't want to discuss whether that's really the case or not. But I want to kind of give you a reason that if you use microservices or something similar, that then kind of Go is a, is a good choice for it. And why is that the case? So the first three points here kind of like Tom has already presented them. Uh, I only want to kind of go into one point in more detail. And that's kind of the performance aspect. And <clears throat> because I could show you some kind of random benchmarks here uh, and talk out of my ass. I rather want to kind of show you some use cases uh, where really where people really use Go and replace something existing and got a benefit out of it. And so for that, I have kind of two uh, blog posts quoted here. So one is from parse.com, this is kind of this, this company that Facebook bought, and they do kind of some cloud backend stuff. And the other use case is uh, RepuState. They do kind of like some form of of text analysis and also provided via an API and stuff. And the common thing when you read those blog posts is that basically all of them kind of uh, report from a kind of a great uh, performance improvement in those examples, even like an, an order of magnitude, right? So they could re reduce their resources by 90%. And also other things like deploying your stuff because in Go you have like static binaries, so you can, in principle, you can just copy your binary and you're done. And also like deploying your API, all those things improved. And those are just two cases. I think you can talk to, to people at Google and they could have a lot of more use cases about this. And so what I kind of want to tell you, of course, not everybody can just say, okay, hey boss, let's rewrite our whole API in, in Go. I was on this meetup on Friday, it was super. Uh, but maybe if you start a new project, something small, uh, then maybe use Go and, and show other people how great it is. And then I think it will kind of spread. This just as a motivation. Now to the actual, actual technical details. And first about JSON a little bit. And you might think, oh, why is this guy talking about JSON, right? JSON is so simple and uh, <laughs> what am I doing here? But in Go, there are some gotchas, and especially if you come like from Python or so, uh, which I did, uh, there are some, some traps you have to take into account. And actually, it's not only me. This is the related tags on Stack Overflow from Go. And the second most related tag is JSON. <laughs> so you see, apparently, behind Google App Engine being confusing, <laughs> um, JSON is also confusing. And yeah, and that's why, <laughs> and yeah, and that's why I want to show you the, the basic stuff. I could talk more about this, but just the basics. So the basics is Marshall and unmarshall. So Marshall, you take uh, an object, and then you, you will marshal that, and you will get the, the byte array, right, the encoded JSON. And the opposite is unmarshal, where you pass your byte array, which you got from somewhere, and then also you pass the object into which you want to decode. And of course, both also return an error in case there was something wrong with it. Good. So how does this look in practice? If you're coming from Python or from Ruby, I think everyone is kind of like going, OK, let's take a map, because that's what you do in Python. You just do a chase and dumps, and you got your map. So you want to do the same in Go. And then you quickly realize, ah, wait, but maps are typed. So in only very rare cases, you have kind of a JSON where all your keys are only strings. You might have integers, strings, booleans, and all that kind of stuff. So then you see, OK, I need to use interfaces, and specifically the empty interface. And this is what you see here. And do you see the mouse? Yes. Uh, 
we're, there we're using the empty interface. And all the types implement the empty interface. So that means that kind of we can decode all the types into this type. But then in, in the last line, when we have decoded our value, uh, our JSON, then we need to do a type assertion. And I think this is something Tom has not shown. But what it basically means is we have this interface, which gets matched by everything. But then if we want to use it, because we are type safe, we have to say, OK, what I use now, this is supposed to be a string. And if this is not a string, actually, then you will get a panic. And this works. And yeah, if we run it, we kind of uh, get the expected output. Uh, hello, go, one, two, three, four, five. But this is ugly, right? We don't always want to use these type assertions. So what I did was I looked a little bit more. And then I found, OK, we can use actually structs to, to decode into. And so not knowingly, we write our struct called message1. And we have these two fields, message string1. and the ID is an integer. And then we do the same thing again. And who wants to guess what the output of this program is? If you have been listening carefully <laughs> so far, you might know it. But maybe in the beginning, it's a little bit difficult. So anybody wants to guess? Nobody? Uh, thank you for saying this. No, it's not an error. It would be nice, maybe, if it was an error. Yes, right. So what we get is. Uh, empty string zero. And like someone said, it would be nice if it was an error because basically it didn't happen what you would expect, right? And why this didn't happen, the reason we already heard today is that the member variables, they have kind of not a capital letter in the beginning. And this means that they are unexported. And so other packages cannot access these variables. And this is true what, what the JSON package does. It uses reflection. But also, reflection can't read this value. And so the library thinks, great, there's actually nothing. This destruct has no member variable, so we don't need to set anything. And it thinks there's no error and just does nothing. But of course, when you kind of do this, your client will not be happy when you send this to him. And so then we learn about these that we need to use capital letters in the beginning, and then we use this. And now the first print line here will actually work. Now we will get the expected output. But then what we will do is we will might kind of modify some values on the struct and then send it back to the, to the user. And what we will now get as an output is, again, something unexpected. Because if you see, like, in the first line in our JSON, we have, like, message is small, the key. And now if we decode this, we will actually get as output uh, the key in the JSON as, again, in capital letters. And why is that? Because the decoder kind of, when decoding, it does a case insensitive match on the member variable name. And so it kind of matches the message key. But when encoding, by, def it, by default, it takes the capital letter. And again, your client will probably not be happy because it would expect a small key. And the final solution, then after having wasted some time, you arrive at, uh, at struct tags. And these struct tags are like a feature of Go. Uh, you see it in the, on the very top in our message struct. struct. Uh, after the variable, we kind of define this, text, this tag string. And there, we first kind of say the, the tag key, JSON, and then the actual kind of key we want to use for that JSON. And once we do this and use the same code again, we get the expected output. And now we have the small the small key names, and everybody is happy. But it took some time, and this is only kind of like the beginning. There are like more complicated use cases. And again, I see one of those questions every day on Stack Overflow. And so to kind of sum this up, the basics, be aware of those tags and use them. Otherwise, you won't be happy. And pass a reference to unmarshal, because unmarshal needs to set values on your object. This is at least an error if you don't do this, so this is nice. Uh, another kind of gotcha is that if kind of let's say you have like a sub map in your JSON and you have this map as type of uh, as a member of your struct and then you decode this struct and this actual map was not in the JSON you decoded, you will get a nil map. And nil maps are kind of tricky because reading from them is fine. You could, for example, use like len of this map and it will return zero. But once you write to it, it's an error. So check for those. 
yeah, so this just for JSON. I think this is, even if you do only some kind of client stuff side, uh, JSON stuff, this will be useful. Good. Now about, like I said, REST. Good. Um, so the HTTP standard library is already quite powerful. Uh, you saw a basic example in, in Tom's talk where we defined one of those handlers. But to kind of, if you think of like REST, uh, one, I think the, the first pattern people always think of is kind of like this, where you have an, a, a URL path and you have kind of the ID in the path, and then you match on that. And this is not possible with the standard, standard library in Go. And so to get that functionality, we use uh, an extra framework, and this framework is called Go Chase and REST. And <clears throat> one thing that's already nice about this is there's, that there's like a whole repository only with examples of, of, of it. And this gets you started quite quickly. And it provides kind of two features. One feature is this additional handler interface and router interface, which we need for kind of this REST functionality. And the second feature is kind of a middleware support so that you have kind of a defined interface for middlewares, which everybody can then write. And to show you this framework, and it's only one of many, there are a lot of frameworks. Uh, we want to write a small example, basically kind of a paste bin application and which with, with a JSON API, and we will do this in, in just three slides. So it's, it's pretty simple. And how do we get started? Uh, first, we kind of need to set up this framework. And this is actually all you need. And there is, it might look much in the beginning, but there is actually only like, let's say four functions that you need to, that you need to execute. And the first thing we do is we kind of define an API object. This is from the REST package, new API. And on this API object, we will then work. And the sec in the second line, in the second highlighted line, we see that we can kind of use middlewares. And we will come to that later. And then we have this router. And this router, what it can do more than the standard one is that here you see uh, that we can kind of define a path parameter with this uh, colon and then ID. And that means in our handler, we can then read this ID from, from the path that was accessed. Once we have done that and checked for an error, all we need to do is we, on this API, we set the router. This means that we could actually also use a totally different router. And once we have that, we call on the API make handler. And you see that we return an HTTP handler. And you don't have to know what this means now, but what we see here is that kind of it fits nicely with the standard library, right? It doesn't need any specific server or something. You just fit it in, in the standard library. And that's something which a lot of frameworks do. And I think that's is kind of a sign that the standard library is really strong on this aspect. Good. Now we need kind of those two handlers, right? To, to get a paste and then later to post a paste. How does this look more specifically? Uh, on the very first line, you see our, our handler interface. And if you remember back to Tom's talk, there you already saw this interface. The only difference is that now we are not have those types from the HTTP package, but from the REST package, which is like the Go Chase and REST framework. And I like this because even though it's a different type, it's the interface is, is the same. And what those types do is they kind of wrap the standard, the standard types, and then only add small utility functions that are useful. And we will use the first one in like the first line of our code. And here on the on the request, we will path param, we call path param method and extract the ID. And here we now get the actual ID that the user requested. And of course, we then have to, because it's a string, we have to encode it to an integer and we do that. And if that worked, uh, we kind of do a store get. This is just my abstraction because I don't want to annoy you with database stuff now. And the store get returns like a paste if this paste was found. And if it was found, it's kind of in this OK variable. That's something we also already saw today. And if we found it, what we do is we call this write JSON method and just pass our struct. And what this write JSON method does on the response writer is that it abstracts this encoding to trace in a way so you don't have to do, that, to do that yourself. And that's it. And if we didn't find a value, we call rest error. And there's also an HTTP error. 
uh, with, with the same interface, but what REST error does, it, it returns the error as JSON. So we see not much. The framework doesn't provide too much functionality, really just what we need. And then if we want to create a paste, uh, what do we do? Looks pretty similar again. Uh, we create our object, then we call decode JSON payload. This is the wrapper for JSON unmarshal, and this will set the, the values in our struct that we passed, and of course, also return an error if there was one. And then we store the value, and this might, for example, set the ID of the created, of the created struct, and then we just write it back. And that's it, right? Now we kind of have a simple pastebin application, which you can use with a, with a JSON API. It's not much, and a lot of power already comes from the standard library. This, this REST framework only adds like small utility functions to get a better router and also handle the JSON part. The, the second uh, big thing I, I mentioned at the beginning was middleware support. So I don't know who of you has kind of try to get some kind of middlewares working with the standard library, and this kind of gets ugly. So this is why there here is special support for it. And to use a middleware, we simply call the use function, which you saw before, and pass our middleware object. And <clears throat> how does this look more specifically? So for example, if we want to use uh, JSON Web Token authentication, we use the JSON Web Token middleware, uh, we can set here the key, for example, the, the timeout, the max refresh time, things like that. And once you have created this, this middleware, we use it. And then it will auto automatically run for every request. And another middleware might be the if middleware. So this is kind of more like, let's say, a functional thing where, depending on the path, we can kind of activate the middleware or not. And the only thing that's kind of open with middlewares is, is how do they kind of transport state? And this is, I think, one of the open questions in with all the frameworks in Go. And the way that GoChase and REST has chosen to go is that on the request object, you have kind of a map from a string to an empty interface. So here, the middlewares can set the values. And then, for example, this JSON Web Token authentication middleware, it sets on the key remote user, it sets the user, uh, which got automatically authenticated, and then you can access that in your handler. And going back to our paste example, if we now wanted to support users and set this user on the paste, we could simply do this like this. And again, here you'll see this, this type assertion because this is an empty interface. Great, so of course there's more middlewares for Go, Chase, and REST but there's also a lot more frameworks. Uh, one thing that's maybe common to all of them or to most of them is that they are all not big, right? I here showed you in 10 minutes, like most of the functionality of Go, Chase, and REST. And like I said, this a lot of frameworks have this in common. And this is, I think, kind of the Go mentality. You do something very well, but you don't do too much. And so if you're kind of like a Django guy, uh, this is maybe not your stuff, but I like this because you can just get started. You don't have to remember too much stuff, like don't define some weird Django configuration file, and you just get started. Great. Now on the final part, uh, gets a little bit more tricky, and I hope you stay with me. Uh, this is about writing microservices in general. And a common pattern you have with microservices or with APIs is that you might have a front end which takes the request from the user, and then this front end queries a lot of other back ends. It could be other services, it could be a database, it could be other RPC systems or things like that. And the pattern you find there is that you could have different scenarios. It could be that you want to do 10 requests, and you want to do those 10 requests in parallel, because you need all of them, and of course you want to save time. It could be that you kind of query a sharded backend, and you're actually only interested in one response from those 10. Or you say, okay, I want to render in 200 milliseconds, so all of the services that have replied to me will get rendered into the page, the rest we are no longer interested. And what you then want to do is, in all those cases, is you kind of want to cancel the rest. 
because you no longer want to, to waste resources, right? If you have complicated handlers that do complicated stuff, you no longer want to do this. And Go has a nice solution to this problem. And the solution is the net context package. Who has heard of this? Uh, who of those people are from Google? <laughs> so it's almost uh, the same amount and the same people. So you might guess where this package come fr comes from and where it gets used extensively. Mm. And you see this X in front of it. And what this means is kind of there's like this golang.org slash X library, which is, let's say, like almost standard. It's kind of like libraries that are highly maintained, that are of high quality, and that at a later point might get into the standard library. Yes. I believe that this is actually being formally mainlined. The right yes, on. there's this, this, um, this mailing list uh, threat these days, and I think the, the target is like 1.7 or so, right? And so, yeah, like Matt says, this might get more standard. And I think this is great because what I mentioned before is that all of the frameworks kind of do something differently to, to transport the state or to do whatever. And if we had this in the standard library, I think it would be, be, be pretty great. And at the top, you kind of see a quote from the documentation. So it's not only carrying values across APIs, but it's also carrying a deadline or a cancellation signal. And now, how do we do that? And there are kind of two important methods on this context interface. The first is the done method. And what it returns is a channel of an empty struct. So this is basically a done channel. And in Go, you kind of use this to kind of signal something, which means that if somebody's listening on this channel and then the channel gets closed, uh, the one who's listening on it will get notified. And <clears throat> like this, we can kind of signal somebody, aha, you're getting canceled, please stop. And the second thing for carrying values is this value method, where we take a key and interface and then also return a value. And what's maybe interesting is if you kind of look into those factory or make functions that produce a context, you see that all of them take a context as the first argument. So what this means is that these contexts build a hierarchy. They build a tree of contexts. And this is again great because if you cancel like a node in this tree, all of the children of this node will be canceled as well. And those children will also have access to the values which we set in this context. And this fits this pattern I described in the beginning, right? If you push off some requests and they again send some requests, you kind of send the signal through this request tree to cancel all of those requests. And because this might sound a little bit abstract now, uh, at least it did to me, I kind of want again to walk through a simple example or simple might be relative, but uh, I hope you see the concept. And what we do for that is uh, we kind of implement a weather service, uh, which you can query with a string, for example, the city string, for example, Zurich. And then what you will get is uh, the current temperature for Zurich and the forecast for Zurich, nothing more. And <clears throat> how do we do this? Uh, for this, we kind of use two other APIs, other packages. One is the city API. We will use this to, to show how you can kind of work with values in contexts. And uh, also the other is the weather API, which then does the actual request to kind of the backend. And here we will see the cancellation come into play. So more specifically, the very first thing we do is we call from the city API the from request function to extract the query. And this here is really just the helper function. Of course, it could include some validation logic and a lot of other stuff, but here it's just to show you that. And once we have that and check for an error, we create our first context. And we create a context with a timeout. And two things. So first, we as the parent context, we pass context background. So this is kind of like the root context for everything that you can use. And then we pass a timeout of 200 milliseconds. So that means after 200 milliseconds, this context and all its children will get automatically canceled. And of course, we see here that we want to respond in, in 200 milliseconds. If we don't do that, we return an error. And we also get back this cancel function. 
And this cancel function we can use to actively cancel the request prematurely if we had an error or something. And once we have this context, we create yet another, another context. And this time, this time from the city API. And what we pass as well is the city query. So of course, what we do here is we create a context. And on this context, we will set a value. And we get the newly created context, with, with, which is then a child, basically, of this context we, which we created here. And this context we then pass to, to the weather API, which then does the magic. And now we want to look how this is implemented more specifically. So first, the city API. Uh, this is really everything. Uh, so at the bottom, we see this from request function, which just parses the, the query string. Nothing big there. Uh, more interestingly is from context where, uh, sorry, new context where we create a context. Context, this time with a value. Again, the parent context, which we passed and the key and the value. And here you might maybe see another kind of Go-ish thing. Uh, what we do is we kind of, at the very top, we, this pattern we saw quite often today. We define a type key, but this type key is actually just an integer. But it's a different type, and that's important. And then we kind of define this constant of type key with a value of 0. And we use this key to set the value in the context. And why are we doing this? So imagine we would just pass a 0 here. In this case, if another API, another package, would do the same, we would kind of have a conflict. And if we used both, then we wouldn't know kind of which value we are actually getting in the context. But because we do it like this, and because we use this special type, uh, the way interfaces work in Golang is that if you compare two interfaces, they only compare equal if they are of the same type. And because we have this unexported key type in this package, in the city package, this will never compare equal to any other type and any other key. And like this, we can kind of set our value and be sure that there will be no collisions. And of course, exposing this to the user would be kind of ugly. And that's why we kind of provide the scatter function from context, where given the context, we get the actual string that we stored. And that's it for kind of working with values. And we will later see where we read the, the city. Now the weather package. Here it gets more complicated. Uh, so the very first thing we do is we create two channels in the first line. And <clears throat> we have this result wrapper type. This is unimportant. And these two channels we will then pass to two go routines. And those two go routines, which now actually execute the real HTTP request, uh, will send us their result back on those channels. And now you see a new concurrency uh, statement in Go. Uh, I think we didn't see this today. It's the select clause. And the select clause is, I think, what makes channels really powerful. Because by default, the channel is maybe not more than a concurrent queue, right? But with select, what we can do is we can actually read from multiple uh, channels uh, concurrently, or let's say try to read from multiple channels. And whichever of these channels is ready, will kind of get selected. It's like a switch case, but just for channels. And if multiple channels are ready, this will be randomly. And so we iterate over this twice, because we need to read from both of our result channels once. And But what's also interesting is that each time we also uh, select on the done channel from the context. And what this means is if the context gets canceled, at this point, we will select this case and return. And we will immediately return return an error. And like that, this go routine, or whatever is executing this query thing, will return immediately and no longer waste anything. And maybe two things that are implied here is that first, of course, you might think, and that's right, that those go routines that we spawned in the beginning, they are still running. So we need to cancel them as well. And we will see in a second how. And also, kind of, the scenario which we're implementing is that what we say is we want to receive both of the values. If we read one, but then we get canceled, we will also return an error, right? Because if this case gets selected, we return the error immediately. 
even if we had read one value already. So this is kind of just the concept here. And now, how do those score routines get canceled? Because of there, of course, we also have to implement the cancellation. And for that, we have the get implementation, which is because get temp and get forecast are basically the same functions. They just query different backends. So <clears throat> I have this get impl here. And the first thing here is that we now see the city API again. Because now, when we want to do the actual HTTP request, we, of course, need to know to which for which city. And that's why here, with the city from context, we extract the city query. And here we saw how the city value got carried from the city API over kind of our handler to our, our weather API. And once we have that, we create an HTTP request. This is Go stuff, not so important here. And then we execute HTTP do. And HTTP do kind of now does the magic. And what do we pass to it? The context again, uh, the request we created, and the callback. This callback will be called once HTTP do returns. And then we'll kind of handle the response, which is not important here because it's just business logic. And also note that HTTP do is blocking. So we can just pass our result kind of into the, into the lambda, into the closure, and set it directly because we only return an error. And <clears throat> once we have that, we send our value back on our channel. But the actual cancellation is happening in HTTP do. And here, kind of, we really save something. What we do first is we create kind of an HTTP transport, HTTP client, again, go stuff. Uh, but then we create yet another channel. And we create an error channel. And this error channel will, again, only be used for kind of synchronization. And synchronization with what? With another Go routine that we spawn. And this Go routine now executes the HTTP request. And what the Go routine that spawned that Go routine, so you see a lot of Go routines at play here, uh, then selects on is, again, the context done channel and this error channel it just created. And <clears throat> if this channel here returns, then our HTTP request has returned, hopefully, uh, Hopefully, the error will be nil, and then we return just that. But if the context is being canceled before our HTTP request returns, what we do is we call on our transport, on our client, we call cancel request. And this will cancel the actual HTTP request. And what it also will do is the callback, which will then be called with the result of the HTTP request, will then have an error set. So the callback can check, was an error? Yes, I don't have to do any processing anymore. Don't have to do maybe any allocations I do or things like that. I can just return. And here is the point where we save stuff. And that's actually already everything of this example. And it might have been a little bit confusing with all the Go routines that we spawned and kind of like three functions deep, but just to remember back what we actually implemented was we have two APIs and this one API does two HTTP requests to maybe two different backends or to one backend and <clears throat> if either the, the timeout happens, like, right, we are above 200 milliseconds, those two requests will get cancelled. Or another case could be that if one of those requests returns an error. And at that point, we know we can no longer successfully render our page. Uh, we also cancel everything and cancel the other HTTP requests. And like this, we have nicely solved this problem, which I described in the beginning. And <clears throat> if you want to have more info on this, there is actually a nice talk from the author about this and also a blog post about this. And the example I showed you, it's similar to, to the blog post. You will also find this HTTP do function there. And yeah, it's great. And like Matt also said, I hope this goes into the standard library. Two little things I want to add is like, number one, one of the things I really like about the context library is it allows you to transform asynchronous APIs and operations into something that has a synchronous surface, which is usually just much easier to work with. Much better for resource for like actual cancellation of resources and, and all that, preventing actual resource leaks. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, Really nice. Yeah, and to sum this up, uh, maybe like the beginning, Go is boring, right? 
writing this uh, this Go Chase and Rest stuff was not particularly exciting. There was no fancy like ORMs or serialization stuff. Uh, <clears throat> it's simple, but it gets the job done, right? You don't need to learn all those frameworks. And also I said that the frameworks are simple, are specific, but yeah, they get the job done. And the language enables us the concurrency, and that's what we saw in the last example, and it enables concurrency, I think, at a very nice style, because we can read the code from the top to the bottom, and for example, if this was in Node.js, I would have to jump from callback to callback, and I think you guys would understand even less than you did now, so <laughs> I think this is great. And then we have the standard library, which is already quite powerful, and will get even more powerful with net next net context. And of course, this kind of builds on the concurrency features, which are in the language. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs>